Hey, what's up? <laughs> it's after midnight. Uh, I'm taking a break from watching the riots. Riots every night, every night. Live riot. Gabba Gabba, hey. Uh, this is a video uh, for a kind of final discussion leading up to our last discussion about uh, the White Fragility book about how to be an ally. And it might be timely given what's going on in the world right now, uh, especially in America, especially as it burns. Uh, so I want to do this quick lecture, and then I'm going to get back to the news uh, and hope that Portland is still there by the time we're done. So we're going to discuss kind of this. There is a, a new language about diversity, which is how you engage in creating equitable situations. How do you do this? And so we talked about this in the Zoom discussion. We work on these three levels. We work on the institutional level, which includes institutions like higher learning and institutions like Nike. Uh, we work uh, on the cultural level, how we respond in our community, and how we work on the personal level. And this is about sort of the personal level and how we personally engage in movements to increase diversity, movements to eradicate exclusion and increase inclusions, movements to make equity a real practice, how we actively position ourselves to engage in the interruption of oppression. This is something that's not a hobby. You don't do it on Black History Day. You don't, you know, this is something that's meant to be not just a practice at the workplace when something arises that's uh, problematic. This is meant to be a day to day way to lead your life. Instructions in good living. <laughs> All of a sudden, I feel like I should be doing this on a religious channel. Oh, oh no, no, no. This side. Drink it from this side, Randy. Um, the, uh, and so what we're, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of this new language about allyship and what it means to be an ally. And what does it mean to be an ally? What do we mean to be, be, what does it mean to be an ally? How are we defining it? It's a, it has many different definitions of what we talk about how to participate in movements that aren't directly impacting you. So as a white person, what does it mean to be an ally in the movement against racism? As a heterosexual person, what does it mean to engage in the movement against homophobia and the oppression of our LGBTQ friends? Um, I had someone, I was at a panel one time, who said, she said, I really don't like the term ally. I like the word accessory. Because, you know, there's a notion of a criminal accessory. Uh, that we don't need allies. We need accessor accessories. Accessories to what? Accessories to rectifying oppression of groups that you don't have a membership in. You know, I mean, part of privilege is I don't have to worry about these problems, right? As a white person, racism is somebody else's problem. As an able-bodied person, ableism is somebody else's problem. As a cisgendered person, it's transphobia, somebody else's problem. I could just take a pass and, you know, read about it in a class like this and not have to worry about it. But what an ally or an accessory is going to do is going to move away from their privilege, work to dismantle their privilege, and work to create some type of real social justice. And one of the important things about allyship is you don't have to fully understand the complexity of the oppression. Racism is complex. Ableism is complex. I mean, we haven't even got into the discussion about biases against people with mental disabilities uh, because that is a whole 10 week conversation in of itself. So you don't have to understand the complexity of it, especially the way someone who's actually living with that oppression daily uh, you just have to care enough about it uh, and see it enough to want to address it and want to change things. And also, you know, there's this sort of language about allies. That oppressive, oppressed people don't necessarily need allies. They just need people who aren't being oppressed to do something about the oppression. You know, it's not like we have to come to save the day. Here comes the white person to save the day. Here I come to save the day. Here comes the straight person to save the day. Hey, I'm going to save the gay people. That's not what folks need. What folks need who are in oppressed situations, in marginalized communities, in disempowered uh, social locations, whatever you're talking about, is they need people to deal with the injustice. Okay, so I'm going to talk about kind of three, three, four areas, four areas, I'm going to talk about four areas, and then I'm going to talk about some sort of things we do and things we don't do and, and introduce some terms like centering that are popular in this conversation. This will lead us to our kind of discussion of the end of the White Fragility book. Okay, so four things uh, to think about. Is one is reaching out. 
Um, we are in bubbles. You hear that term a lot in this work. We're in our bubbles. We're in our white people bubble or cisgender person or able-bodied people body bubble. Uh, and you have to reach out and develop connections with people that are different than you. You have to be able to have that uh, human relationship. You know, my grandmother, uh, and I, I tell the story all the time, but she never met a Muslim uh, until she realized she needed to meet a Muslim because she had all these sort of preconceived notions about what Muslims were like uh, in her life in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And then she actually met one and it changed her freaking mind about a whole faith of billions of people. So people have to reach out uh, and make those human connections to see the people as opposed to the stereotypes or the, you know, the memes. Um, but when you do that, some things to keep in mind, you have to be mindful of the trauma that groups have experienced. Uh, including from people that might look like you, and here you are reaching out to them when traditionally you've been the one that has been oppressing them. So that may be a factor in reaching out. Why would they want to trust you? Because in the past, there's always been some ulterior motive to anything like that. You want to resist tokenizing people. Uh, I'm reaching out to you. You're going to be my black friend. You're going to be my gay friend. You're going to be my Muslim friend. You're going to be my Sikh friend because I need someone who's different. And therefore, they're not a person to you. They're the category that you belong to. And you also have to recognize that there are going to be some walls that some people don't want to be reached out to. They're distrustful and it's not their job uh, to help you feel like you're a more inclusive person. So often the reaching out has, is best done with people that you will work with people that you're connected with through your family, people in your neighborhood, people that you already have a personal connection with uh, that you can say, hey, can we have this conversation? We have this con conversation. Our, our um, neighbor across the street has a uh, uh, George Floyd RIP Black Lives Matter poster in their window. We're having that conversation. What does this mean to you? Can we talk about what it means? Um, so that's number one. This is sort of reaching out, but also be mindful of it. You don't want to be a but you don't want to be annoying, right? You want to be mindful of trauma and tokenizing and the reasons people might not want to talk to you. The other part of this, and this is the big part of this pursuit that takes a lot of work, is to educate yourself. You, There's lots we don't know, right? We're all ignorant. We're all ignorant. You might not know anything about the Sikh religion. There's a lot of Sikhs that live in this area, so maybe you want to learn about the Sikh religion because you're probably going to run into a few uh, if you don't already have Sikhs in your in your life. Um, so that means you can ask questions. You can ask questions, but part of this is permission to make mistakes. You know, to use the wrong language. So, you know, I've had to uh, tell students, understandable white students, uh, people of color is, a, is the appropriate terminology. People, uh, colored people is not. People of color, yes. Colored people, no. What's the difference? The difference is how people want to be referred because colored people uh, has a reference to the Jim Crow days, to the way that black people were referred to in the 1950s. So you really have to be able to um, be willing to make a mistake, but sometimes ask people, well, how would you like to be referred? You know, oh, to, oh, transvestite, you're not a transvestite? Oh, okay. You know, to be able to ask those questions and not get defensive, meaning fragile, when you get it wrong. When you get it wrong, say, oh, I, well, I can't say anything. Uh, and so uh, being, asking those questions, uh, understanding that there are many answers to those questions, that there are many perspectives, that blackness or Asianness or queerness is not monolithic, and you're going to get different answers about these things from different people. Some people are going to be very hostile. Some people are going to be very welcoming and inclusive. Some people might be hostile in the morning and welcome and inclusive, inclusive a little bit later in the day after they have a cocktail. So you have to understand that you're not going to get one universal answer from one person at one time. So it means asking those questions all the time, having those conversations all the time, not saying, well, you know, I talked to this black guy in, in 2019, and so I think I understand it. No, you need to have those conversations uh, all the time. Also knowing, again, that some people might not want to talk about it. It's not the job of a person of color to educate every white person who wants to know, what's it like to be black? What do you think about Black Lives Matters? It's not up to every trans person to say, well, what do you think about RuPaul? You know, it's not their job to educate us. And in fact, if they do that work to help us, they should be rewarded. Cup of coffee, $20 bill, you know, something, some type of reparation 
for uh, taking their time, their time to help us understand their lives. I mean, this is a point I really want to hit on because when I am doing work in the community, I mean, my job often is to talk to disempowered people and get their stories. And what have I gotten out of it? I've gotten a PhD. I've gotten a career. I, I own a house. I get on TV. Like, I've gotten a lot of What have they got out of it? Not much, right? Not much. They spent however much time talking to me, and I take their story, and I profit from it like a pimp. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that the people who share their insight on their experience with us are somehow rewarded, even if it's a cup of coffee. Okay, that is an important point because we don't want to exploit people uh, for our own benefit. Can I say that one more time? We don't want to exploit people for our own benefit, meaning, you know, we don't want to like take their story so we can be better people and leave them with nothing. Oh, you know, maybe they're a better person. No, they need some tangible uh, payment for their time. Uh, and to learn about history from the perspective of the oppressed. We learn about the world from the conquerors, right? We learn about the age of discovery from Europeans and the story of Columbus, the great hero. We don't learn it from the story of the indigenous people in the Caribbean who were slaughtered and raped and tortured by Columbus and his people. Uh, we don't. We learn the Vietnam War story from you know the the conquering, which they didn't really conquer very well, conquering powers. We don't learn it from the story of the Vietnamese peasants. So when we learn that story, when we learn that history, we want to make sure that we're getting the other side of the story, you know, the story of oppression, because that a story of oppression helps us to unlock the trauma that exists in present day. Because often, you know, you read a Wikipedia entry and you think you've got the story. Uh, there is so much to the other side of that story. So the second part is educate yourself. The third part is then you, once you're educated, you start to influence the people around you. Uh, you influence your peers, including your family, which is the hardest thing in the world. Dad, oh, let's have a conversation about, you know, racism in 2020. Uh, that you, you, you work with your peers, the, the people that you work with, the people that you hang out with. Some of that includes interrupting bias. When people say things that are wrong, when they use the wrong terminology, when they use the wrong, uh, you know, a, a racist perspective, you know, that all oh, these black people rioting are just, you know, just animals. Well, ho hold on a second, my friend. Okay, I know that's a popular narrative, but let me tell you. Oh, well, you know, that George Floyd that was murdered was resisting arrest. Well, no, actually, he wasn't. And we've got the video data to prove it. But why do you want to believe that? Because that's a white supremacist narrative. So be able to interrupt things, especially, you know, especially interrupting sexism. And we're going to talk about this in Zoom, about how we actually do sort of that interruption. Um, but also when we're influencing others, and this is the hardest part, is how we teach our children. How do we teach our children not to internalize the crap that we've internalized? How do we in teach our children not to internalize racism and sexism, right? Those are two huge ones in society. You don't raise your kids in a vacuum. So even if you're the most woke people in the world, your kids are still going to get that. And you have to be able to navigate when that pops up. And I've talked a little bit about this in my house when Cozy has said some things that seem like she's valuing white people at a, a, a differently than valuing black people. How do you help those children through that. Uh, and that also is a full-time job. It's not a one-time thing. And then the fourth part of this is what I like to call radical self-reflection. This is why we're reading this book, wherever it is, White Fragility, uh, that you really have to think about how you respond to these situations, how you get defensive, how you have these evils in you. You want to think of yourself as a good person. You are a good person. That doesn't mean you can't have these um, these biases woven into your brain. So we have to be able to acknowledge how we have um, been affected by implicit bias. This is the dialogue about implicit bias and how implicit bias is a part of us. So um, there are um, some things to do and don't. I just want to, and then I want to kind of talk a little bit about this exercise. So you know, you want to be a good listener. You want to think about implicit bias and the moments where they pop up, and sometimes that's an emotional moment. So when we're getting kind of hot and heavy or drunk or angry, um, you want to um, think about how you're going to respond in those situations. You want to think about what the oppressive situations or systems that you engage in 
that you can have an impact on. Big conversation now about racism and policing. What opportunity do you have to influence that system or the system where you work or the system where you're at school? What are the, your opportunities to try to change the power dynamic, including getting people to see their privilege um, and getting people to challenge the, the structural imbalances uh, and, and, the, and do listen Listen with grace. I love that word. Uh, listening with grace, being able to accept criticism. And sometimes that means sitting with your discomfort and wanting, wanting to know, being curious about why am I, why am I uncomfortable with this? What, it, what is this that makes me fragile? Uh, and to spend time sort of sitting with your emotions. What you don't want to do is speak when you should listen. Uh, don't expect to be taught, right? The people are not in charge of educating you. Uh, don't act like you know what's best or you've got it all figured out. Don't take credit for the work that other people have done. Um, and don't don't assume that everybody in a, in a you know, marginalized group feels oppression the same way, that it's a very complex thing. And so the, 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 the term I like to use, and there's like a country music song that it's called, um, I'm just a work in progress. <laughs> I love that line that we're all works in progress that, you know, I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. Yeah. I ha I got a lot of work to do, but I ain't done yet. And you know, the truth is I don't think we're ever really done. We're never completely woke. We're always sort of dealing with these demons. We've got sort of the woke angel on one shoulder and the oppressive devil on the other shoulder. They're always there. So to, to know that we're kind of always on this, road uh, and we're making mistakes but we're working on it that we're working on it that we're a working process um, allows you to have a little bit of humility and not think that you've got it all work out you're never going to do like Donald Trump says when he says I'm the least racist person there is like no non-racist person would say that no anti-racist person would say that every racist person non-racist or anti-racist person would say I'm racist yeah I am I know it I acknowledge it but I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. I'm working on it. Um, I think Trump, what would happen if Trump rang red, white fragility? So anyway, I want to end with this little exercise that we do. And this came off the internet. I think it was invented by somebody on Twitter uh, about how to uh, get around some of the stumbling blocks, some of the things we, we tend to do in these conversations, some of the landmines. Uh, and the exercise is called boots and sandals. And the idea of this is instead of talking about race or ability or sexual orientation, we're going to talk about shoes. Uh, and let's say the boots are the dominant group and the sandals are the oppressed group. I don't know who came up with this, but I think it's pretty brilliant. I should find out. Um, yeah, I think it, oh, it was from uh, originally from a tweet by a woman named Kayla Reed. So she gets credit. I'll, I'll try to find it and include a link. Um, so what happens in this scenario is someone with boots steps on the toes of someone wearing sandals. So the sandals are open, your toes are out. Woo! Oh my God. I swear to God, I'm wearing pants. Um, and uh, so literally you're stepping on someone's toes, right? So that's often a metaphor for, you know, offending someone in a certain way. So the first thing that we really have to look out for, for the, um, when the, um, toe stepping has been called out, hey, you stepped on my toes, is the notion of centering. Is that people you know, who, are, who are white or able-bodied or whatever the dominant category will make it all about themselves. And we've read about this in White Fragility. It's called centering. So in this situation, you know, what centering would look like is the boot wearer saying, I can't believe you think I'm a toe stepper. Toe stepper. I'm a good person. I'm not a toe stepper. Like, so all of it becomes about them instead of being like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I stepped on your toes. Let's, it's about you because you're the victim of the toe stepping. So, you know, when people in dominant positions make it about themselves, it's called centering. And this is something as a white, straight white male, whatever, I have to be very careful that when I'm engaged in this work that I don't make it all about me. Let me tell you my story. Uh, it has to be about them. I have to shut up and, and allow them to have the space and not make it about me. Um, or it could be the denial of the impact, the denial that the other's experience uh, are, are, are um, different. So that might, in this situation, be somebody saying, I don't mind when people step on my toes. 
So therefore, stepping on your toes shouldn't be a problem. Shut up, quit complaining. And so, you know, in a, in a situation about race, somebody would might say, well, you know, people say things about me because I'm Czechoslovakian. And so, you know, shut up because I've experienced the same thing. So that denies the other's experience. Then there's this term, and I love this term, the notion of derailing. It's when you want to talk about something that's completely irrelevant, something that doesn't have anything. And this happens all the time on Facebook and Twitter when people want to argue and they go off on some crazy tangent. So this might be the person who's this toe stepper saying, well, some people don't even have toes. Why aren't we talking about them instead? Um, you know, there's a lot of that, a lot of that. Look over, our president is really good at that. Like, look over here, at this. it's Antifa. It's not, it's systemic racism. What about Antifa? No, we need to talk about systemic racism. He's really good at derailing the conversation. Uh, the, refu the, refu the opposite of centering yourself is the refusal to center those people who have been impacted. So this would be, in this case, saying, well, all toes matter, not just your toes, sandal wear. You know, so where have we heard this before? I, thought, I mean, I just saw All Lives Matter trending again on Twitter, right? It it refuses to look at the impact of those who are, are negatively affected by the toe-stepping or the racism or the homophobia. Uh, tone policing. You know, how we... Um, uh, we police how people respond. Like, you didn't respond in the right way. You're being too angry. You're being too uppity. If you would just, you know, calm down a little bit. So this might be the person saying, I'd move my foot if you'd ask me more nicely. So, you know, when we try to, like, say, like, well, it's not me stepping on your toes is the problem. It's how you expressed anger that I stepped on your toes. And, of course, we get a lot of this. Like, you, you have to protest appropriately. Kneeling during the national anthem? No, no, no. Marching the streets? No, no, no. <laughs> like, it has to be, like, you know, your tone has to be in a very narrow box. Um, the denial that the problem is fixable. This is a big one, because we think, well, there's no solution to the problem. Why should we do anything about this? So this would be the person saying, toes getting stepped on is a fact of life. You bet, you're, you'll be better off when you accept that. So, hey, racism is just the way it is in America. I just accept it. There's no solution to it. There are solutions to these problems. There are solutions to these problems, including these things that we're, we're talking about. Um, there's victim blaming, blaming the person who had their toes stepped on. You shouldn't have been walking around with people with boots <laughs> and those stupid sandals. What do you expect? You know, so we blame poor people for being poor. We blame women for being raped. We blame black people for, you know, being the recipients of racism, why don't you just pull yourself up by your white bootstraps? And the last one, and this is the one that really pops up a lot in D'Angelo, is withdrawing, is getting so um, fragile, getting so defensive when uh, you're called out on on your oppressive behavior that you just back away. So this is, I thought you wanted my help, but I guess not. So I'll just go home with my boots on. <laughs> You know, people will just say, I, I can't say anything right. I can't do, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. Uh, and all those things are things that we are trying not to do. Not center ourselves, not deny the impact on others, not derail the conversation, not, not deny the impact on those who are impacted and centering them, not worrying about people not being angry in the right tone, uh, denying that the problem is fixable in any way. Uh, we don't want to blame the victim and we don't want to withdraw from the conversation. We want to stay engaged, but it's hard. It's hard to do a lot of that. And so these are all things that now as an ally, you have to be mindful of. And it's a lot of fucking work, but it's worth it. There are people who are just like, Jesus Christ, it's too much work. I had a moment uh, when I was sort of called out for my fragility uh, in front of a whole bunch of people on a, on a, in a conversation about racism in Portland. And my first thought was, why did I choose a career in this? Why didn't I? My, all of my friends from college went to work on Wall Street and are all millionaires now. I should have done that. <laughs> that was my initial response. And I had that moment of like withdrawing and being like, screw it. This is too much work. Um, it's worth it. It's worth it. You got to pull yourself back in and it's got to be a constant thing. But it is also a constant thing when you're on the other side of the equation. It's a constant thing when you're black. It's a constant thing when you have a disability. It's a constant thing when you're queer. It's a constant thing when you're a woman that you're having to deal with that. So it is at least slightly balanced, slightly when allies feel uncomfortable. Because that's what it's going to take to 
break through this power dynamic and get to a place where we don't need a riot in the streets. Okay, we're going to have that conversation a little bit more, but I wanted to put that together. I'm going to go back and watch the news and see how my city is doing. Martin Luther King once said, rioting is the language of the oppressed. I got a lot to say. A lot to say. All right, peace and love. We'll see you soon.